Thank you, everybody, and thank you for having me tonight. It's it's really a pleasure. Um, I I, I want to begin by saying a couple of things, right? I, I think it's uh, I even though we're today uh, talking about anti-Semitism in the U.S. on the basis of the findings of the 2019 audit of anti-Semitic incidents that ADL um, put out a few weeks ago. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't refer to a few things. Uh, one is, obviously, we always say that it starts with the Jews and never ends with the Jews, and that anti-Semitism specifically and Jews are the cannery in the coal mine when it comes to racism and xenophobia. And um, the events of the past 10 days since May 25th, roughly, um, have indicated or confirmed that anti-Semitism, xenophobia, hate, and systemic racism are alive and well in the United States today. Um, that sadly, um, the murder of an individual at the hands of uh, police has sparked uh, protests all around the country. Um, and that I think we should recognize that before we move forward. Uh, we should also recognize that this happens in the middle of a very difficult moment, which is a recession as a result of a pandemic. Um, and that the backdrop of what we're going to be talking about today, which is the 2019 numbers, just present to us a way to introduce an existing situation that will inform what will result when we come out at the other end of the tunnel uh, in 2019 when some of the restrictions and social distancing norms are lifted. Um, I say this because um, Jews are already being blamed for COVID-19 and for spreading COVID-19, um, but that's nothing new. It's the same old monster wearing new clothes, basically. It's um, the plague of the Middle Ages. It's uh, many tropes rolled up into one. And I think we need to acknowledge that. Uh, the other thing that I want to refer to very quickly before I go into the numbers is the fact that we are sincerely afraid of what's going to happen with the 2020 numbers um, once the full effects of the recession are felt the economic downturn, I should say. I don't, I, I'm not a, an economist to qualify where, whether this is a depression or recession or um, the correct economic uh, terminology. However, it is true that every time that there is an economic downturn, somebody is scapegoated and it's normally Jews and other minorities. Um, immigrants in many cases for taking jobs, so on and so forth. So I'm going to pause there um, it, with that introduction and say that um, having situated ourselves on this, um, the situation was indeed stark uh, in 2019. We saw very many things, um, but Chief among them is 2,107 incidents of anti-Semitism during the course of one year. Um, that's about six incidents per day, if you think about it. Um, that means that we can lose sight of the fact that because of how large these numbers were, that there is an individual, a family, um, an institution, or a community being affected by each one of these instances. The other thing that I wanna say before I move forward is what the audit is and what it isn't. The audit is a measure of anti-Semitic incidents in the country. It is not a measure of anti-Semitic attitudes. For that, we conduct surveys. And I can tell you that the last survey that the ADL conducted registered that 11% of Americans held anti-Semitic attitudes. So what is sparking such a large number of people acting out? You may ask yourself. And I think that's a question that comes up every time 
that I speak about these numbers? And uh, the answer is manifold. The answer is um, the way in which our leadership speaks out from the left, the right, and everywhere in between. How in a hyper-polarized, hyper-partisan world, extremes are resorted to. And that trickles down into society. That trickles down to our schools and our children, probably through the internet in many cases and through traditional media. Um, but the result is clear. The result is that more people are being emboldened to act out uh, at the rate of six incidents per day. Um, this also, by the way, is not a measure of acts or incidents of uh, anti-Semitism on, on the internet or online. Um, although some of the incidents that we're talking about uh, have happened online, um, we don't measure or we don't count those incidents unless they have directly targeted one individual or a specific group of people. Um, so how do we break these numbers down? ADL basically accounts for or counts three basic categories of incidents, harassment, vandalism, and assault. Um, and you can see the breakdown over the years. By the way, let me go back for a second to the previous slide uh, for context uh, before I move forward. Uh, one of the things that strikes as one of the biggest conclusions of the audit uh, and the trend that we've been tracking at the ADL is that we had seen a downward trend, as you can see, from the year 2010 down to 2013. Um, and there was a downward trend and we thought, oh, maybe anti-Semitism is no longer a problem in the United States. Maybe, you know, through our education programs and other initiatives, we are starting to see things improve in our country. And yet, since 2016, you can see that the numbers have nearly trebled in our country, which speaks a lot about what I was talking about before, meaning what is happening. Um, so what does that look like? How does that breakdown look like again? And I'm sorry for having backtracked before. Um, we saw 1,127 incidents of harassment, 919 incidents of vandalism, and 61 assaults. That's tremendous, if you think about it. But let's talk about what the composition is there, right? And how things were moving. Um, when we're talking about harassment specifically, you're talking about individuals who are being targeted because of who they are and it goes from a random slur thrown out in the street at someone as they're walking back home on their way from synagogue let's say on shabbat um to kids being bullied on school campgrounds school grounds specifically um and everywhere in between vandalism and assault go even further because it's no longer uh, the those sticks and stones, proverbial sticks and stones, right? It's actual, somebody's actually going to great lengths to deface, harm a property or an individual, assault an individual, hit an individual. Um, and the particularly uh, worrisome number here is obviously the increase in assaults from 39 the year before to 61 uh, in 2019. Um, and that includes, by the way, four trends that we saw during the year. And I can speak further about these because sadly, uh, you know, out of the four most problematic trends that we saw uh, in our country during 2019, our office in New York and New Jersey had to oversee and respond to uh, three of those four trends. Um, but let's start with 
um, the fact that Jewish institutions were targeted um, 234 times during the year 2019. Um, that's 154 synagogues, 30 flyers, and 60 incidents of vandalism. But that also includes the Poway incident that occurred at the beginning of the year in March, um, where a Chabad was specifically targeted by a white supremacist individual or an individual holding white supremacist ideology. Um, it was followed later in December um, by December 10th, more specifically by the Jersey City shooting that was in that case uh, perpetrated by individuals holding uh, what is called the Black Hebrew Israelite ideology. It's, for those of you who don't, uh, who are not familiar with that, uh, the Black Hebrew Israelites are a sect um, that holds the belief that Jews are imposters and that have appropriated uh, the true uh, chosen people and the true Jewish religion from um, African Americans specifically, uh, and who also believe that whites are envoys of, of Satan, more specifically. Uh, in the middle of that, by the way, the situation uh, took a turn for the worse. Uh, and we saw roughly eight assaults in the, in the days of Hanukkah that were bookended by Jersey City and Monsi, specifically. Um, meaning that Monsi, uh, or the Monsi stabbing, and I can talk about that further if you would like me to, but the Monsi stabbing um, was the closing of, in the closing nights of, of Hanukkah more specifically, uh, was pre preceded by a long string of assaults and Jews, three of which occurred in a single day, by the way. And 25, by the way, of the 61 assaults, um, sorry, 25 of the 61 assaults that we saw throughout the year um, in the United States happened in Brooklyn alone. 35 happened in New York State and an, and an additional five happened uh, in New Jersey. So that accounts for about 40 of the 61 incidents uh, in those two states alone. Just problematic in and of itself, of course. Um, we saw a hardening number, uh, you know, there's some good news here, basically. It's that uh, campus incidents decreased during the course of the year. Um, it, it, we saw from 201 incidents the year before in 2018, roughly 186 incidents in 2019. 20% of those, by the way, had some mention of Israel or Zionism um, as part of that which is of course problematic in and of itself, uh, given that students are being targeted um, for their beliefs um, that there should be a Jewish homeland for the Jewish people. Um, and I'm sure many on this call probably espouse that belief as well. The other thing that is particularly um, problematic, by the way, is I'm sorry, I was using the wrong slide for some reason, um, is the fact that we hold at ADL the belief that our children should be free to study without the threat of being harassed uh, for who they are, for what they believe in, their, rel their religion that they hold. And um, when we see the number of incidents of anti-Semitism occurring in K through 12 schools, uh, particularly an increase from 344 incidents in, in, in 2018 to 411 in 2019, um, including seven assaults, um, 220 incidents of, of vandalism and 184 um, incidents of harassment. Again, I, I wanna situate you back in the fact that each of these are children uh, or their schools and institutions that are being, that are being targeted for who they are. Um, but it's also uh, a testament to the fact um, that one of the main tenets of ADL's programming is education 
as a way to solve this and go about the problem of hate, bias, and anti-Semitism as a whole. Um, and also the fact that children are, are less constrained by social norms than adults are. And so it is um, a sort of testing ground to understand what the state of hate in our country is. So when we see increased levels of anti-Semitism in schools, we're worried. It worries us tremendously. Um, finally, or um, almost to the end on this particular part, we saw, for context, a number of incidents that were carried out by extremists. Now, I don't want to say that these were exclusively anti-Semitic, by the way, but there's a lot of propaganda going on uh, in the United States by white supremacist groups, um, including, but not limited to, the Patriot Front, uh, the Loyal White Knights, uh, the New Jersey European Heritage Association, uh, just to name a few. Now, of those incidents, uh, we saw 2,700 incidents of propaganda, and that is a separate report that the Anti-Defamation League puts out every year, accounting for that. Uh, 270 um, contained specific anti-Semitic imagery. Now, I don't have to tell you that even though we don't count the 2,700 as incidents, specific incidents of anti-Semitism, each time that a minority group or a Jewish person encounters one of these flyers or stickers out in the street, um, this obviously con contributes to their feelings of anxiety um, and obviously climate of fear um, among Jews and non-Jews and Jewish minorities as well. Um, so again, 270 or roughly 10% of the 2,700 uh, were considered specifically anti-Semitic with imagery that is similar to the one that I'm showing you right now, meaning that there were swastikas or specific um, uh, references to, to the Nazi regime, so on and so forth, or uh, caricatures and cartoons of Jews in, in stereotypical tropes, more specifically. Um, finally, there is a category of incidents um, that we uh, look at every year, uh, which is a specific category of anti-Zionism or anti-Zionist activity. And that is also up uh, from 140 incidents in 2018 to 175 incidents in 2019. Um, some of the imagery um, is, is what you're seeing now. Uh, the Jews perpetrated 9-11 uh, um, or white supremacist iconography affixed to uh, an Israeli flag, more specifically, uh, which attests to the fact that anti-Zionism can indeed be equated to anti-Semitism uh, in many instances, and, and, and there can be no mistake about that, uh, I, I believe. Um, now, what are we seeing right now? This is the outlook, right? I, I have given you uh, the doorway or, of what we were seeing, what the president uh, was in 2019. What are we seeing now? We're seeing a lot of extremist activity uh, associated with sort of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, people taking advantage of the fact that most activity is going online uh, and perpetrating what is known as Zoom bombings uh, or illegally or without permission, uh, disrupting a religious service or some sort of meeting and ceremony um, using the tool that we are using tonight, which is Zoom. Um, we have worked at ADL with Zoom to try to help them improve their security protocols uh, to impede those instances. Um, nonetheless, um, there are many who are exploring legal action around um, those disruptions specifically. There is also, um, as I said, not only extremist activity associated with these Zoom bombings, but also um, uh, extremist activity occurring during the protests associated uh, uh, over the last 10 days with the African-American community more specifically. Uh, people who are trying to infiltrate uh, these marches and who are trying to edge people on 
to less than peaceful, peaceful demonstrations, uh, which is obviously something that worries us terribly. Now, uh, because um, I belong to the New York, New Jersey region, I wanna talk to you about those two states as well, really briefly. Um, now, as you can see, this is what ADL has developed. It's a tool that we have developed called the heat map. The heat map, basically, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, uh, pinpoints where things are happening or depicts graphically where acts of anti-Semitism are happening. Now, in New York and New Jersey, we saw roughly 37% of all incidents of anti-Semitism occurring in the United States. Which means that when you look at this map that I'm showing you right now, the bubbles around the Northeast overshadow every other bubble um, you can possibly see. And I've talked to you already about some of the trends um, that we saw there. Now, when it comes to New York State more specifically, we saw 238 incidents of vandalism in 2019, 157 incidents of harassment, and as I told you already, uh, 35 incidents of assault. Um, that is an increase up to a total of 430 incidents of 26% um, from 340 the year before. As I'm able to show you, the trend in assault continues to move upwards. Um, there were 11 incidents of assault in 2017, 17 in 2018, and 35 in 2019. And by the way, I want to say something here, um, which is the, insofar as the methodology is concerned, ADL counts incidents and not victims. So what does this mean? Uh, if there were five stabbing victims in the Monsi stabbing incident, that counts as one incident, not five. The total number of victims, by the way, in the United States was 95 uh, of those 61 incidents that I mentioned before for the totality of the country, more specifically. Now, when it comes to territory and territorial distribution, um, 75% of all incidents that we saw in New York State occurred in the confines of the five boroughs. Um, that speaks to a number of things. Obviously, uh, the majority of the incidents occurred in Brooklyn, as you're able to see in this map, um, followed by Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island, and the Bronx. Now, we have been pointing to the fact that more reporting and more training of law enforcement is necessary uh, because we think that for however large the population is in New York City, um, having that large concentration in, in one specific area is not possible necessarily. Um, there, there must be more training of law enforcement. There must be more reporting mechanisms. Um, and that happens, by the way, in many large cities across the United States. You're seeing jurisdictions like Buffalo or Syracuse um, report to the FBI zero or one uh, hate crimes per year. Um, for such large cities, that's just not a viability. Um, now, really quickly, insofar as New York State is concerned, Long Island saw about 46 incidents of anti-Semitism. Um, Westchester County, 21. Um, that is up from nine, or about 133% the year before. Rockland County, by the way, is a, another instance of underreporting. Rockland County is home to Monsey. Uh, and some of the largest Hasidic and Orthodox populations um, that we know of in, in New York State. And there is a trend there of roughly four incidents reported over the last two years. 
And we think that's just not possible. And some of our partners have indicated to us uh, on the ground um, service organizations um, that, they, that they may see, may have seen a lot more incidents. They're just not being reported either to the police or to the agencies like the ADL. Um, there is, of course, as you can see, a distribution uh, over time of these things. Um, the majority of the incidents were concentrated around the final quarter of the year, as you were able to see. Uh, there was a respite around the summer months. Um, but we're still worried, very much worried about, about the, the way in which things had been progressing, because this indicates to us that coming into 2019, that 2020, from 2019, that things are on the uptrend, if you're able to see this graph more specifically. Uh, when it comes to K through 12 schools in New York State, um, we're up 19% from 36 incidents in 2018 to about 43 in 2019. Uh, and also campus incidents um, were down. So they were following the national trend. Jewish institutions um, were up 63% to, to 13 incidents from eight the year before. Um, and I want to move on now to um, the state of New Jersey. State of New Jersey is a very different trend. It's the highest number of anti-Semitic incidents ever reported in the history of the state with 345. The prior peak was 300 incidents, as you're able to see in 2003. 2004, I'm so sorry. Um, so I want to provide a, a, a slight explanation for some of this. There might be a correlation here with a new reporting mechanism that uh, the state of New Jersey implemented for it, the entirety of uh, its law enforcement and civil service. We are seeing ADL sees more cooperation with law enforcement news outlets and ordinary people reporting to it. We have many of those partnerships. However, we do think that it is a commendable effort when a state, when, when a state implements a new reporting mechanism that enables us to see the full picture of hate or a much better picture of hate. We still think there is underreporting in every single state of the country. Um, nonetheless, we are hardened to see that there are policy changes here um, and that moving forward, we will be able to see even more if we, if we use this as a benchmark. This was implemented by uh, New Jersey's Attorney General, Grabir Gowal, uh, with the full support of Governor Murphy. Um, and, and we see this as good news. There are other trends here. Um, obviously, when you see um, how things have increased, um, 161 incidents of harassment up from 94, uh, 179 incidents of vandalism up from 104 the year before, and five assaults, which, you know, sounds like very little, but the physical harm done to an individual and the trauma that is generated by having someone uh, think that they can go ahead and hit you out on the street um, is something that people don't really tend to forget. As I said, the environment in schools is something that we track very closely. And you're seeing this tremendous spike in K through 12 school activity in New Jersey, uh, up to 97 incidents in 2019. Um, many of these, by the way, um, include simple swastikas, or hate symbols sketched on a desk or school property. But others do have scars. Uh, we have seen in the past students having to drop out because of how severely they're being bullied. Um, students who were on upward, uh, upward trends um, and uh, who were due to enroll in very prestigious universities uh, after they graduated. Um, 
And so that has a very lasting effect on the individual that suffers. Um, and the community itself has to rally from the trauma of coming. Imagine you're, you're coming into your school one day and you see an entire wall graffitied with hate symbols. Um, I don't think that's something that a student forgets very easily. Um, in terms of territory, um, you can see the concentration uh, in the state of New Jersey around the coastal area. But one thing uh, that I want to point to is that Ocean County, New Jersey, which is the home to Lakewood um, Township, Jackson, Tom's River, um, Howell, and, and Brick, um, went from uh, 21 incidents of anti-Semitism in the year 2018 to 54 in 2019. So what happened there? You may or may not have heard of a group, Facebook group and accompanying um, website called Rise Up Ocean County. Rise Up Ocean County uh, it was a group uh, that emerged in October of 2018 and was taken down by Facebook eventually with, by the way, ADL's participation and help, including their, their YouTube channel uh, uh, in March of this, February, March of this year of 2020. Um, but during the course of 2019, we were able to see how uh, Ocean County, New Jersey went from fourth in the state uh, in incidents of anti-Semitism to first in the state in incidents of anti-Semitism, which is a clear testimony in my way uh, and, and some proof that what happens in the online world doesn't stay in the online world and trickles down to the real world, uh, including incidents like um, where we saw um, 56 cars had their tires slashed in one evening. Uh, and this was celebrated before it happened and etched on before it happened and celebrated after it happened on the group that I'm referring to. Um, with the very, very notable trend that only houses um, with mezuzahs on them saw the cars parked in front of them get their tires slashed. So the second county in the state, by the way, is Bergen County, which is another county with a very sizable Jewish population. But you can see how the concentration is along the coastline with the exception of Hudson County, which is anyway where uh, Jersey City is um, and where uh, the Jersey City shooting occurred. Um, so I'm gonna stop here and uh, I'm gonna open up for questions. I, I wanna thank you for listening. I hope uh, I didn't take too long. Um, I think I did, but nonetheless, um, I'm all ears. Alex, thank you. That was that was great. I uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering why don't you count uh, in, individual people who are harmed as opposed, you know, in other words, you count nine people who were stabbed in one incident as one incident. Why don't you count them as nine? Um, that is the best practice that is recommended by FBI in their investigations, um, and that is the way that law enforcement, on a nationwide basis, counts these incidents. Um, and so we have adopted that practice as a way to ensure statistical parity between um, or, or statistical equivalence between the numbers of hate crimes that are published by the FBI and our numbers in many cases. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Alex. This is Peter Gottlieb. I, I'm curious as to what you might know about our organization and and had any thoughts about how we might partner with you on activities, programming, et cetera, to accomplish your goals as well as ours. So look, I, I this is a phrase that I have adopted, but I think that each and every one of us has um, you know, if, if we think about being a light among the nations as a principle, right? Um, I think that that comes with the duty to become ambassadors against hate, to try to, to, try to stop hate wherever we see it. Um, and I think that goes through institutions as well. 
um, we have a program um, called Signature Synagogues uh, that strives to create committees uh, in synagogues specifically, but it can be adapted to other institutions like uh, Jewish clubs. And um, um, obviously I, I, I wanna invite you and if you have any curiosity as to how that could be implemented, um, obviously uh, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to me. I will put you in touch with the right people in our organization and we can try to move that forward. Uh, obviously, speaking engagement like these, engagements like these and other trainings that we have are, are paramount um, and, and are a basis for a lot of the activities that we do, but also promoting our educational programming, uh, uh, anti-bias education, so on and so forth, is also something that I would recommend uh, in terms of partnering up. Um, so open, open to any discussion, um, and if, uh, if I have missed characterized any part of the project <clears throat> of the organization, uh, forgive me. No, not at all. How about you personally, you and your office, are, are you, do you find yourselves targets of harassment? Um, so given that this is being recorded, uh, I'm going to say yes, uh, but not provide many examples for security reasons. Uh, but, but it is the case, and it is the case that we have found ourselves um, targeted because of the, the you know, we're, we're on live television, uh, we write op-eds, we, uh, we make public appearances, um, and some of us become recognizable and our names become recognizable and um, some of our um, social media accounts become targets uh, in many cases. Um, but it's not, it's, I don't think we have to personalize the fight. Uh, or try to make ourselves into um, any type of heroes for fighting that fight. I think uh, when I say, or, or martyrs, by the way, for that, for that matter, um, I think that everyone, I think what, if one thing uh, or one conclusion that I derive from these numbers is that every single one of us, for the mere fact that we could be wearing a yarmulke, or be recognizable or non-recognizable for our last names could be the target of an anti-Semitic incident. Uh, and I, I don't think that we can lose sight of that. Um, regardless of the fact that you work at the ADL or you're a doctor or a lawyer or, or an entrepreneur or own your own shop somewhere, that is what we're seeing. We have a, uh, Alex, we have a uh, committee, uh, Steve Mandel is here on that, uh, which is the uh, Imagine Life program, and we are promoting uh, mental health awareness. And do you find that these anti-Semitic incidents uh, have a detrimental effect on people's mental health? Not only, of course, the physical health, God forbid, of being attacked, but physically attacked, but what's the, the, the uh, harm to them mentally? Well, you know, without, without portraying myself, and hi, Steve, by the way. Steve and I know each other. Um, <laughs> um, Steve is also in my, one of my committees, um, but um, I hope I don't give too much away. Um, you know, without portraying myself as a mental health specialist, um, I want to say that there's, there's many effects to each, each one of these incidents, right? And they're very lasting, by the way. I was trying to refer to those before when I was speaking about how individuals don't tend to forget when something like this has happened to them. But also they have ripple effects throughout the communities. And some are akin to PTSD in many ways, right? Uh, people relive um, the incidents as it happens to them uh, over and over and over again. And they blame themselves many times for well, what would have happened if I, I hadn't walked down that street that night or why did I have to quote unquote provoke uh, someone um, for the mere fact of being Jewish, right? And I don't think that's fair to anybody. And I don't think that any community should have to live uh, with those lasting effects uh, for many years or so, and sometimes uh, entire lifetimes. Um, so um, we have partnered up in the past with um, organizations providing uh, psychological support. Um, 
okay. in the aftermath of incidents, particularly um, deadly incidents uh, like the Jersey City shooting or the Monty stabbing or the Poway incident. Um, but it doesn't have to go that far. There, there was an incident during the course of 2019 where a gentleman had an entire rock uh, thrown at his face by an individual and some of his teeth were knocked out. Um, and that got a lot of publicity uh, and occurred in Brooklyn. Um, so yeah, I, th I, I think that it's not only the individual that is affected by lasting psychological effects, but it's also that individual's family, uh, that individual's community, um, and how it provokes and induces fear in the people that it affects and that people that touches. And I think that we can't lose sight of that because of the large numbers that I showed in the, at the beginning. Steve? So um, the ADL is very much involved in healthcare disparity among those who are disabled and those um, who are uh, perceived to be culturally victims. So the ADL has been a leader in that regard. And can you describe some of those programs and initiatives of a positive nature that we're bringing to the community? Yeah, so I think in general, the ADL tries to be a voice against those who are being discriminated against more specifically. Um, we provide advice. We have um, advocated for individuals who have suffered uh, discrimination or disadvantages in many ways. I think um, if you ask me, you know, um, how the ADL contributes in general, it's not a dissimilar way to what each and every one of us can do, which is to speak out, to use our bully pulpit, um, to encourage legislation, um, being enacted to curb uh, those who are disadvantaged or discriminated against. Um, obviously, um, you know, urging others to use those bully, their bully pulpits to call these things out. Um, and, you know, obviously trying to educate the public to build bridges of understanding, right, in, in many ways. Um, so, I think depending on the state, because this is a national organization at the end of the day, um, you will see different efforts being enacted and being localized um, and adapted to uh, the specific needs of the 25 offices that the ADL has nationwide. Um, and so it really does depend on where you're living, basically, uh, the, the effect of what, of what you will see. Um, I can tell you that um, you know, we, my team, which is the operations team uh, in our region, finds themselves often, let's say, calling into nursing homes and trying to ensure that adequate uh, care is being provided to certain individuals when they even write in, because they can't even fill out many times a online form. Um, they're in these institutions and, and, you know, they don't have access to the internet or they don't have access to computers many times. Um, and so uh, they write a letter and uh, our team scrambles and tries to help out as much as they possibly can. So the next question is, um, what can the ADL do to assist the Federation in Jewish Men's Clubs in promoting your No Place for Hate programs? And how can we relate that to our 25,000 members? So for those of you who don't know what No Place for Hate is, so ADL has an entire suite of educational programming um, out of our World of Difference Institute, uh, stemmed one of the flagship programs in education, which is an anti-bias education program called No Place for Hate. Um, and that program is in... Um, more than 200 schools in New York State alone uh, and thousands of schools around the country uh, serving hundreds of thousands, if not millions of kids um, in trying to sort of not learn or be deprogrammed for, from bias uh, and unlearn hate, so to speak, because learn, hate, as we say, 
is a learned behavior. Nobody is born hating the other. So if, if hate can be learned, it can be unlearned. Uh, and that is the aim, the ultimate aim of uh, most of ADLs, if not all of ADLs, educational programs. Um, so what I would say is, if you know your uh, superintendent, if you know your principal, um, present those programs to them as a way uh, to, to fight hate everywhere. Um, I think that if we fight it through education, it's a winning battle. If we try to fight, fight it elsewhere, we don't have as much as an advantage. Um, uh, but again, I think it's, it's something that we can try to disseminate through uh, the Signature Synagogue program that I described before uh, and in many other ways. Uh, and it, of course, there are other programs that's not only No Place for Hate, as, as, as Steve mentioned. Um, uh, we have a Campus of Difference and Hate Uncycled at the top in, the, in, in, in higher education institutions, going down all the way through uh, K through 12. Uh, peer training programs um, that encourage individual facilitation from uh, students and, and others. So um, I'm going to leave it there because I don't, I don't, I don't want to take up too much time about education. But if others have other questions um, and how we can implement those, uh, certainly do contact me and, um, or our team and, and, and we can help you out. Thank you. Victor, you had a question? Yes, uh, first I thank you for your excellent presentation. I like the mapping, the mapping aspects. I, I was uh, helping the uh, NYPD in develop their crime mapping uh, about years ago. And I think a lot can be made, maybe you've done this, but a lot can be made from the mapping of the incidents. There are uh, maybe from the uh, U.S. Census, and you can compare different things. One obvious question in a particular area, because there are more Jews or because there are more Jewish institutions, or is there a segment of the society that is close or nearby that uh, encourages the incidents there, and so on and so on. So there, there are many different ways to look at once you've mapped this excellent database. And I don't know if you've done any of this, tried to compare why there is more in certain places. Absolutely. Um, if you, I, I will encourage you, I showed you um, the, what we call our heat map, which is our hate, anti-Semitism, um, extremism, um, and, uh, and terrorism map, uh, which goes down to the zip code level specifically. Um, and enumerates all of those types and different layers um, in the map. And it's a searchable index, uh, very similar to what you're used to from her, what I'm hearing about uh, when it comes to law enforcement. It's, it's not as detailed sometimes as, law, uh, sometimes as law enforcement, which has to go down to the street level or, or the block level sometimes yes. uh, in, order to in order to triangulate. Uh, where things are happening and so assign patrol cars specifically um, or, or patrol routes in many cases. I, in, in my past life, I was, I, I was doing uh, municipal security planning uh, uh, for, for a mayor's office, so I know a little bit about that. Um, but in any event, I think that there historically is an undeniable correlation between heavily, more heavily populated Jewish areas uh, with numbers of incidents, right? You can't perpetrate incidents of anti-Semitism where there are no Jews, right? Um, but I have to say that we need to be very careful about that characterization because it is correlation, not causation, right? Um, and, and, and I think we need to be cl very clear about that. Um, by the way, nobody should be targeted for the mere fact of their existence in a neighborhood, right? Um, and so there are also factors like migration uh, from one year to the next. Communities establish themselves fairly quickly. One example of that, by the way, is how quickly over the course of two or three years, uh, the Jersey City community established itself um, as a Hasidic community in Jersey City, and then very shortly thereafter, there were victims of 
a crime like the shooting that they had to experience. Um, so one needs to be very nimble in their studies of these patterns. Uh, and that's why obviously we, we rank uh, camp per county and per zip code how things are happening and we're, we're viewing things. And that's how we concentrate our efforts to curb hate as well, right? Thank you, if I may just add one other point that uh, one of the things we did is uh, these cameras. Seizing up, Victor, we're missing part of what you're saying. Pardon? You are seizing up, up. Your, your modem is seizing up and we're not hearing everything you're saying. Oh, I'm, I apologize. Can you hear me better now? So far. Things uh, we learned is that where there were a lot of uh, cameras, where there are a lot of cameras and publicizing that there were um, crime. So we heard there were a lot of converts and then there was a blank. Oh, okay. So I think I heard the gist of the question on the lesson. I'm going to try to answer based on what I understood. Um, there, there, I don't think we can forget that ADL at its core is a civil rights organization, right? It's an it's a anti-hate civil rights organization, and that's how it was founded. To it's an organization that was founded to stop the defamation of the Jewish people on the one hand, mm -hmm. and to secure justice and fair treatment for all on the other, and so. You know, the, the, the use of surveillance in general um, is something that is always up for debate. It's always a hot topic. I don't want to obviously discount it. Uh, there were initiatives of cameras being implemented specifically in Brooklyn because of um, this, this uptick in assaults against Jews more specifically over the course of the last few years. Um, and so I don't want to say a definitive yes, a definitive no. I know that um, those in law enforcement often refer to architecture and, and, and dissuasion um, or deterrence uh, as a smart way to go about deterring crime more specifically. Um, but surveillance is a specific way uh, where I think we need to be very careful uh, in how we implement this, how far and how long we store the footage um, for more specifically, so as to, you know, respect uh, individual freedoms as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Alex? I want to just mention before we close that uh, the uh, the men's club at Tree of Life Synagogue in, in Pittsburgh, uh, there are brothers, and it, it happens that their rabbi is going to be uh, hosted by our organization tomorrow for a pre-Shabbat shmooz kiddush and, and ultimately Kabbalah Shabbat service. He also was trained as a cantor before becoming a rabbi. Mm. So if you would like an invitation to that, <laughs> no pressure. Uh, no we pressure can at all. To forward that to you, and uh, you know, we 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 have a have a, a very strong feeling about that synagogue because of the activity of their men's club, and obviously because of the incident that happened there. Um, so uh, we can share that with you. Uh, uh, please share the invitation. I I have to share that I have a young family, um, that also requires my presence. But if they permit it, I would love to be there. Um, now, I, I, do, I do want to share something about that because I think you bring, up, you bring up an interesting point, which is the, to me, it's the proximity of these events as we have seen them over the past 18 months or a little bit more than that, right? It's who would have thought that in the course of less than two years, you would have had four deadly incidents in the continental United States against Jews, more specifically. Not in my lifetime. Um, we had the Pittsburgh incident in October, the Poway incident in March, the Jersey City incident back in December. 20 days later, we had the Monsi incident. Um, and I think that speaks volumes about the state of hate in our country. 
Very sobering, unfortunately. I want to thank Alex. Thank you so much for the time you've given us. It's really very valuable and very illuminating. I wish it was better news, of course. We all do. Uh, but again, we want to thank all the participants. We wish you all safe. Please be safe and I hope your families are healthy. And uh, we wish you a good evening. Thank you, thank so you very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Good show. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.